So we met Kieran just last year, and it feels like uh, we have known each other for the past uh, 20 years. Kieran uh, is not only a fantastic friend, but he is also uh, one of the best investors we have at Terra, and he's a huge believer in what we are building. Uh, he's also one of the best left backs in the history of football. He played for Arsenal under Arsene Wenger, and he played for the English football team. Welcome to the Terra podcast, Kieran. Thank you very much, guys. Um, and thank you for the kind words, Ralph. Uh, I, I, I feel the same. It's in, the feeling is mutual. Um, I love what you guys are doing. But more importantly, um, you know, I like to support good people doing great things. Um, and when I got introduced to you guys, um, I th it took some convincing, I think, um, on our side to try and uh, let you, you guys get us, you know, a small ticket to your, to your company. Cause I know you had a lot of high demand. So yeah, it's an honor to, to share this journey with you. Um, and happy to talk about, you know, my experiences, um, especially with health data, because it's as an athlete, it's, uh, there's a lot of synergies, um, with what you're doing. Um, and it's obviously a very fast moving industry. So yeah, thanks for having me. Fantastic. Then um, how's Miami nowadays, by the way? Oh, it's... Uh, Miami's great. I've been here for seven months and I've just never seen... Uh, I've never seen a place with such high energy. I've never been in a place with such high energy. They have a lot what? of people moving to Miami at the moment from New York, from California... I think since the pandemic, the growth here has been um, rapid. Um, but why why is everybody go, going there? It's like uh, there is uh, everybody says there's good weather. Everybody says that uh, there's great people around. But uh, what's going on? Why 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 Miami, for example, and not LA? Or why why is everybody moving there? Well, I think the the mayor deserves probably quite a lot of credit for what he's done. Um, in inviting and opening Miami up to, you know, a lot of people that are involved in tech. Um, he's very forward thinking. He's very innovative. And, you know, he's spotted a trend and he's run with it. And so far, it seems that it's paying off. I think as well, the taxes help in, in Florida at the moment. Um, and then since the pandemic, I think obviously people have just rethought how they want to live. Um, Miami's warm. It's, it has a beach, you know, um, and where people were locked up for so long, I think it's made people reconsider their lifestyle. Um, and so it's just caused this wave of, uh, people to move here. A lot of interesting people are, um, are moving here at the moment and have done for the last year. And it's, yeah, it's just a really interesting place to be. Yeah, we, we are speaking with the founder of uh, the CEO of uh, Aid Sleep the other day, one of the best uh, startups in our space. And he moved there in Miami as well. Uh, and we we're speaking about how many startups moved there, how many investors, like some of the best investors in the world, like Founders Fund, have moved there. Everybody's like uh, pushing uh, towards that direction, so let's uh, let's see how it goes. But um, just to to get an idea, uh, can we can we walk you through how you started? Like, what were the early days of football? Um, what 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 actually got you into the into football in the first place? Um, yeah, I mean, football is just like it's just the biggest sport in the UK, and so as a kid. You know, me and my twin brother were just really active. Um, I always just loved having a ball in my hand since I can remember. Um, and then we used to, it was always on TV. Family were big football fans. Um, and it just kind of went from there. The, the minute I kicked a ball, um, I probably haven't stopped since. So I think it just came from the popularity of the sport in the UK. Um, 
And it was kind of all I really wanted to do. I wasn't the brightest in school. Uh, I was, I, I worked hard, um, but I wasn't, I wasn't always the, I was never the smartest person in the room. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I like to, that's kind of how I, I like to keep it. I never like to be the smartest person in the room. That's why I'm always with you guys when I, when I come to London, um, because I just learn so much. And I think the UK is so different to the US because when you, when you grow up in the US, you have to go through the college system. Whereas in the UK as an athlete, you finish school at 16, you sign a scholarship and then your education is limited then because you know, you're full time in and focused on, on what you're doing. So the whole system is different from the US to the UK. Um, so yeah, I've just always, um, had a first for, for, for knowledge really. And like being surrounded by good people that are just, you know, trying to change landscapes in important areas of society. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I've grown to meet you guys. Um, but yeah, football was, was all I knew since, since I could remember really. When uh, when you remember the early days, uh, Kieran, what's the um, what motivated you to get started in the first place? Was it your parents? Was it the environment? Was it the neighborhood? Good question. I think I think a mixture of everything. Um, I think when you grow up, kind of like in in a, in a city, London. Um, Football is kind of like, it's almost a, I mean, sport in general, especially in the US as well, it's, it's an escape. It's an escape from, from reality of hard work in life. Um, and so that's kind of the way I saw it. Um, whenever I was on the pitch, I just felt, I felt free. I felt happy. You know, I loved competing. Um, testing myself against the best and pushing myself as far as I could. Um, I've always had that about me. So I think that that's probably what drove me into, you know, playing at the highest level that I, that I possibly could. And was there like a specific time, if that you remember, when you actually realized that you can compete at an international level, at a very high level? Yeah, I think things changed for me when um, when I start when I signed my scholarship at 16. Um, you you move from the academy building in Hale End in North London, and you you go full time to London Colney, which is uh, where you're surrounded with the first team players and the reserve players, um, and then that's where opportunities started to present themselves for me to be able to train like with the first team, you know, when you were 16, 17, if some, if the team had, if the first team had a game, there would be some reserves training with the first team overs. And that was your real chance to, um, you know, impress the manager. Um, and that's kind of where I took my opportunity, I would say. Uh, and then I would say that a lot of it's luck. A lot of it is luck. Uh, you don't get anywhere in life without without a stroke of luck. So, you know, I had my debut was made uh, when I was 17 and there were a few injuries in the first team. And so they needed, you know, uh, positions to be filled. So that's when I got my opportunity. And yeah, thankfully it went well, um, my debut. And then I think after that was when I realized that, um, you know, if I knuckled down and worked hard and focused, then I would be able to, you know, give myself a real shot at, at playing at, at the highest level. How did you decide to play left back? Was it the initial position you started or what was the, how did you get there? Yeah, that... That's um, that's a good question. I was actually a midfielder before I played 
um, before I played fullback. And my debut, I'd never played fullback before, and that's where I played. So I think that that kind of helped me, though, because it, it kind of, I wasn't prepared for it. And sometimes if you over-prepare, you can, um, you know, it, it can work. You can work both ways. It, it can go either way. Um, but I didn't really have time to think about anything and I had to just improvise almost. I mean, it helped that I had such a great team around me um, to, that f suited my style of play and um, the way I learned the game was I was surrounded by players that had the same philosophy of how the game should be played. So that helped massively. Um, and yeah, so I made my debut without even realizing um, that I was gonna that I was gonna play there until the day before. Um, and then after the game, the manager spoke to me and said that you know he would like me to kind of focus on um, learning my craft in that position. So uh, obviously, you don't disagree with someone like Arsene Wenger, and you you just you just run with it. And uh, that's what I did from 16, 17. How, how, was, he, how was he as a coach, uh, Arsene Wenger, at the beginning of your career? I mean, he was... I didn't know any different, really, at, at professional level. I didn't know any different because he was my first manager and he was my manager for the best part of 10 years, almost. So... Um, It was only until I left um, that I realized that there was a lot of, I had England managers, but England managers, it, international managers are just different um, in the way that they work because they only get you for a certain period of time in the year. Um, so they work a little bit differently. But when I, um, when I left, it was only until then, when I was 27, 28, that you know, I realized that there was a lot of differences in the way managers dealt with players, the way they wanted to play the game. Um, so, yeah, it kind of highlighted um, his strengths a lot when when I left. But at the same time, you know, he was he was like a father figure to you know most of the team that I came through the ranks with. Um, I, I what I loved most about him was. Um, his ability to to give you confidence in you know your ability um, how how was he doing that yeah so he 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 did it without um, without saying too much he wouldn't he wouldn't he wasn't one of those um, people that screamed and shouted although he did he did, he did uh, occasionally Um, but he was always very calm. And so I think his calm in presence kind of, you know, made you in high pressure situations. Um, he would always make you take a step back and try to, um, you know, take in the, take in the moment um, rather than letting it pass you by. And he was, he was very, he was very strict on, Things like diet um, and sleep, and you know, the team always traveling together, and uh, he kind of changed. What does that mean? It's like, can can we digest? Uh, can we go a bit uh, further on that? It's like, what what was um, how much his insistence of sleep was? What like for you to sleep eight hours, for example, or was he giving you specifics there? He would just always, whenever you traveled with the team. Um, you know, we would be, we would stay in, we would stay together even before home games. Um, you know, we'd be away from our families before home games and away games. Um, just so that we were, we were settled and we were kind of as one unit, even, you know, the day before the game. Um, and then in terms of diet would just be like, you know, small things that he changed with, You know, he liked us drinking room temperature water. Like, he didn't like us drinking cold water because he felt that room temperature water was better for hydration. 
um, and the body, you know, reacted to it a lot better than cold water. Um, small things like that. that he Karen, did you actually have specialists in the team uh, who were analyzing this and making decisions or advising uh, Wenger when, when it comes to sleep and nutrition or was it himself independently researching and making decisions? It, I think it was, well, it was himself when, um, when he, when I, I mean, you were going back to like, you know, the 2010, you know, almost 12, 12, 13 years ago. And it's changed so much since then. Um, but when he first came, when he first came over from uh, Japan, he, he did it all himself. And then obviously as the years went on, technology came in and, you know, wearables came in and everything like that came as he was, as he was there. So I witnessed the change from there not being as much innovation in the, the data surrounding, you know, how much you run in games and all of these metrics, the difference between now and 13 years ago is huge. Um, like we had no GPS for training or um, heart rate monitors for training back 10, 11 years ago. Um, so all of these things are new within the last, I would say, six, seven years. Um, so it's been great. It's been, it's been crazy to see that, that shift in the attention to detail on all of these metrics that, um, people are so, you know, feel so strongly about now. What's the one piece of, uh, hardware that you think that actually changed football, uh, in the, in, 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 at the most, let's say, what's um, did GPS change your training a lot? Did uh, sleep trackers change your uh, your training? What what's uh, what's the wearable or what's the device that actually changes? Yeah, I think for, I think for, for football, uh, definitely the GPS, because it, for example, like basketball out here, you can't really measure. It's hard to capture that the GPS data on a basketball court because it's a lot smaller. And these guys are so big, you know, they can get from one end of the court to the other in like six steps. So, you know, you're not really measuring like distance covered, for example, in basketball out here. Whereas football, the pitch is much bigger. You can measure so much more. Um, and the detail that you can get from it now is, is really high in terms of like high speed running, number of accelerations, decelerations. And so when you train with all of these, they can gather, they can gather all of this data and then they can decide, okay, how much does he cover in a game? So how much do, does he need to, what does he need to do in the week before a game that can emulate that in a safe, in a safe way? Um, so I would say for football, definitely the GPS. You mentioned uh, earlier the teamwork part, which is bringing people together in one place uh, before a game. And he was very specific about this. So from a cultural standpoint, startups are super similar to how uh, teams work. And when you think about the culture of uh, an organization, it's defined by its values. If you remember the, the days when uh, I remember when Arsenal was at its peak, what what were the cultural traits that you that your manager was focused on or the team was focused on that made you successful compared to the rest? Yeah, I think it was valuing the, the history of the club, um, the community. Like there was a lot of focus on the community around us at that time because obviously we were so like teams are so influential to millions of people. And so, like, you know, the way you conduct yourself and um, the way you behave, the integrity um, and, and the respect is, like, paramount to um, someone, a club like Arsenal. Um, I, would say, I would say those things were most important to, to Arsenal um, while I was there. 
how how was he establishing discipline if there was any if was he strict about it or was it okay it's fine let's leave it to the next uh, and see what happens yeah. yeah no he he was he was strict i mean it was he would always have characters within the team that would kind of um that that he would have you know on his side that would manage a lot of that for him and then if you if you didn't you know if you didn't follow you know the values of the team you would be called out by the players anyway without without having to be called out by him um so he was very clever and i think in the way that he managed the team where he he had his rules and he almost let the players certain characters in the dressing room um carry those values throughout the team rather than him every day you know being on to you about being late or anything like that characters in the dressing room would would make you follow those rules without him having to do it so much obviously he would step in you know in w- when he needed to um but I like that about I like that um, about him because he gave you the responsibility. It's like right, you know, this is what I want. You you either follow it or you know, you you won't be part of what we're trying to build. What's the um, what's the downside uh, of the culture being the way it was? So obviously you have a lot of benefits, um, but what do you what do you see as the downside? Uh, what was the sacrifice for you? Um, well, the sacrifice was, I didn't really, at the time, I didn't really see it as a sacrifice because it was like, you know, you're playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world. You know, you have so much, um, so much going for you that that seemed normal at the time. And I didn't know, I didn't know any different. Um so I don't really see much downside to you know what he was what he was what he built at the club that was that was that was standard you know that was like that was the standard to to be able to achieve what you wanted to achieve are there any um, key points that when you remember you played so you played for a long period of time for Arsenal. Is there anything like specific that you would say if you become a coach one day and you would be training a team, what makes a winning team? Good question. Um, I think you need I think you need multiple I think you need multiple leaders in the team for one. Um it's no good just having like one or two. I think you need four or five, you know, big characters um, that that like to lead because, you know, at certain times in the season, you can lose those, you can lose one or two of those players um, through injury or um, suspension or whatever it is. But then I would say on top of that, I would say, actually a healthy keeping a healthy team you know the more you can keep your players fit throughout the course of a season the better chance you you're going to have at being able to field the strongest team um at the right time so i think my my first appointment if i was to manage a club would be um would be on the health side so the, the 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 best medical department as such because a lot of the time um when i was at arsenal we 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 would lose key players in at crucial times of the season um where and and a lot as well you know we we went through spells of seasons where we would lose like four or five big players um that you know, were integral to the way we played. Uh, and that just can't happen, like, at, 
you know, at a high level, like in the Premier League. So I honestly think that that would be my first appointment. I would hire like what I would consider to be like the best physios. Um, all, my whole medical team would be uh, the best that I could possibly make it to keep my team healthy throughout the season. In that case, how much would you rely on data? Well, it's key. It's absolutely key. Um, and that's why I love what you guys are doing because, you know, you're, you're curating all of that data into one place that makes it easy for people to make decisions on, okay, has this player had enough sleep? Has this player, um, how are these, this player's um, blood at the moment? How, how was their data in training? Um, all of these things are, you can miss, if you miss by a millimeter these days, you know, that could be the difference between winning and losing. Um, that's that's how fast the game has got now, um, and how like high level these these teams have got. That you really need to like focus on extremely small details to get the best out of the team. Exactly, and the the ability uh, when we think about the um, the opportunities that could be built on top of of Terra when uh, not only on the fitness side or the nutrition or the sleep. Uh, using different health metrics, but also if you think how a player might feel before starting the game, or one day before starting the day, the game, and you would have different um, metrics that show how his feelings changed over the week, uh, stress levels. You would see if he has anxiety, if he has any sorts of emotional problems before the game. This would give you an indication of how to ex how the performance is expected to be not only on the fitness side, but also from an emotional perspective. Is he fit at the moment to play this game? So the psychology of the player before getting into the pitch and playing yeah. a game, how important is it? Yeah, I think you've seen like such a transition on the mental side of the game over the last, um, I'm going to say, six six years maybe you know you wouldn't it was it was a lot it was a lot quieter than you know mental health and speaking about the the mental side of the game um back when i first started that was that was a niche topic you you, you know no one really discussed any of these you know the psychology behind mental health and how it relates to performance But now you you know you probably wouldn't have a team that doesn't have a psychologist now, um, which was abnormal probably ten years ago. Um, so it's been interesting to see that side of 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 the game, not just in in sport, but in all types of um, in any business. Um, it's it's proven to be probably the the most crucial part of being able to perform at a high level one of the things if you measure someone's uh, heart rate variability for example or if you measure the deep sleep levels they had last night or you measure the type of food they had uh, then you can estimate much better the recovery rate once you estimate the recovery rate much better then you can predict the level of performance, right? So if you aggregate all of that information and then you have um, an application or you have a guidance in the recovery level, it's, it's going to be so much more important and it's going to be able to predict your performance so much better that this this could potentially change uh, change the game. How um, how much from your... Today's life, it's it's uh, it's based on wearables. Are you wearing any wearable yourself, or um, um, do you usually wear those GPS vests? What piece of technology are you using when it comes to to wearables? Yeah, so every day in training, we have to wear a heart rate monitor and a GPS for if you if you're outside on the pitch any time, you it's mandatory. It's mandatory to wear. 
Um, I think Ralph's gone. Should we, should we just carry, should we just continue? Yeah, let let's carry on and he he will log in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's mandatory to wear a GPS and heart rate monitor um, every every day that you're outside. Um, and they're looking at um, bringing in. I mean, in, during preseason, you do the you do the finger prick test that takes your blood to monitor how um, yeah how fit you are, how quickly you um, can't you can't recover, basically, um, and how quickly you do recover after a really difficult run. Um, but yeah, we we have to wear a GPS and heart rate uh, every every game and every training session and, and the, during... the heart rate uh, just to touch a bit on that it's like the heart rate is it um do you have to to be working at specific zones uh, of your heart or is it more for the monitoring of the coach it's so what they'll do is they'll kind of they'll at the start of the week let's say the game is on a saturday at the start of the week, they'll have a target that they want all of the players to hit um, by, let's say, I don't know, Thursday. Uh, because Friday is normally more of a, a down a down day before the game. But during the week, yeah, you would they would want you to hit um, a certain distance, a certain high speed, um, a certain amount of axles, a certain amount of D-cells, um, so that it can condition you to be able to play in a game. But they do it under controlled, a bit more controlled uh, environment. So let's say you trained and you didn't cover enough at the distance that they, that they want you to hit. You will just do some strides at the end of a game and they will tell you at, at the end of a training session and they will tell you, okay, you know, you need to hit 70% max speed or 80% max speed and you need to do seven of them at 60 meters or 30 meters whatever it, whatever they want you to hit and it changes for each for each player because obviously you've got players that playing you know center back they they have a lot of they have a completely different map to you know the numbers that they're producing are totally different to a center midfielder or a wide man or so it's very tailored now whereas 10 years ago everyone would just do the same thing um same runs mm. so it's much more tailored based on the individual so it's yeah. like who under, who who is the person that understands the data inside the team is it the coach or is it the data scientists uh, or is it uh, and gym trainer who who is it well, I think before it would be more just just the sports science people. Um, so there would be a data analyst that would measure all of the um, all of the metrics. But basically, I think now the managers have to know about it because they're they're kind of being forced to 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 know more and more about it because you know a data scientist something may flag up on a player and they they will have to say to the manager look you know these numbers are alarming or we may need to pull this player out of training today the manager's like well hang on a minute i need him for training today because i need to go through this this and this or or you know an anal an analyst might say he look he's his numbers are showing fatigue you know, it might be an option to rest him for this game or maybe play him only 20 minutes. And the manager's like, well, why, why do I have to do that? And so now they're, they're having to learn probably, I mean, I don't know, I, I can't speak for all of the managers in all the teams, but my guess is that they're going to have to know more and more about this kind of stuff because it can help, it will help them, their team in the long run. But that's how important it's getting basically. It's very interesting because we see uh, we see this shift in not not only football but uh, many other sports and other industries where the personalization aspect and having 
top decision makers understanding the data is becoming super crucial crucial when it comes to making decisions what's what kind of uh, possibilities or what kind of things you haven't have you have thought of as they would help from a fitness personalization perspective like solutions for the for football specifically or in general in the fitness space that don't yet exist and could be built on top of data um well i i i'm not too sure that there's a metric for how someone is mentally before a game i don't know i, I don't know of any i mean you guys you guys maybe um, but I don't even know if that exists. I don't know if there's a, a way that you can tell, like you said earlier, Ralph, if someone has, you know, um, anxiety, someone has something else going on in their life and they're, you know, they're not stable enough to compete at this level. Um, that could be an area that is, that, that is definitely interesting because we're seeing that the mental side of the game is, is getting so big now, especially with, just the world that we're living in now with um, social media and um, the, the level of attention that's on so many um, different players' lives in, in all aspects, inside of football and outside of football. So I, I'm not sure. Do, do you guys know if there's a way to, to measure that? Um, there is a correlation to be made with heart rate variability. So with your sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. So if you are very stressed uh, and you're very anxious, for example, you're going to have uh, some of the times there is a correlation with low heart rate variability levels. Um, so uh, having a look at it would be pretty interesting. And one of the things you, you usually see is once, let's just say you have good recovery and you slept well, uh, and you wake up, you're going to see that your heart rate variability is higher than if you are very stressed and you sleep and you semi-sleep, right. uh, really. So, uh, and then you wake up and it's like, uh, your heart rate variability would be lower. So there is a strong correlation there. It's a, a lot of apps that are actually building on top of Terra that are using your heart rate variability, um, and assuming there's stress levels, let's say they create correlations based on that. And then they give you certain recommendations about your mental health. Uh, so sleep correlation and heart rate variability uh, are some good indicators. But I think um, the more time we spend into this space, uh, we see more and more sensors coming outside in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, one of the things I would be very interested to see in this space is like uh, hardware that measures... Um, the weights that you lifted, right? You go to the gym. Uh, if you run, you have a GPS and you measure the distance you covered. But if you uh, go to the gym and you lift, for example, 100 kgs in squats and you do like five sets of 10, there is just no way to measure, right? So it could help in, um, if you had a way to measure that information, then it could help the coaches much better to understand how well are you training when it comes to strength lifting and mm. uh and weight lifting and all that yes ha interesting. Ha having said that it's um how is the nutrition nowadays being handled in the teams is it uh, do you have a a chef in the team or do you have a dietitian in the team how is this happening yeah so you have you have um chef and nutritionist Nutritionist deals with all of supplements, basically, and um, deciding what the chef is should cook, and that varies on different days leading up to a game, post game, um, and focuses. Yeah, so every morning you will have like a little box by your um, with your name on it, um, and you just use all of the supplements from uh, i don't know i'm not i'm not huge on knowing all of the names of all of these uh, supplements there's so many now i'm like swallowing like eight tablets a morning um <laughs> omega-3 and you know all of these all of these uh crazy things that changed a lot since since i first started playing um 
but it's really interesting to be honest to like um, to see how it's to see how everything's evolving. I'd love to see it in like ten years from now. Um, let's just say what's um, let's just say that you you have a game today. What's usually the nutritionist uh, right for you to have? It's like what what are the meals of the day? Um, so in the morning would normally be it depends what time the game is. Obviously, you eat you always eat between you always probably eat three hours before before the game two and a half three hours before the game starts would be your pre-match meal and then when and then when you get to the game you would have maybe a gel or two or you know half a banana or something like that um and then let's say it was it was a morning game it's obviously if it was a 12 o'clock kickoff it's quite hard to eat pasta at um, nine in the morning um, and chicken and stuff like that. So it does, it, you, you do get options, um, whether it's, you know, oatmeal or um, with fruit, um, smoothie. Um, they, they let you be quite flexible because at the same time, it's like, you know, how much... Uh, what what are the actual benefits of eating these kind of meals when you've just woken up um, from sleeping? So, but night games are normally, you know, heavy carb pasta, um, a little bit of veg um, and a selection of, a selection of meat, small selection of meat. So it sounds like there is a concentration uh, around the games, like pre-workout, post-workout, to be heavy in carbohydrates, and then yes. the rest of the of the times is much more focused in recovery, which yeah. is going to be more protein, greens, and all that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's a that's a, a super interesting discussion from uh, the standpoint of. Even in the nutrition space, how can you make it more personalized? You shouldn't all eat the same amount of carb or the same amount of proteins. It's based on how your body functions and physiologically you should how much you should eat. And this is uh, another topic that is uh, we, we see a lot of companies building on top of Terra and trying to personalize nutrition. One of uh, one of our uh, biggest clients is actually uh, doing something like this. They would look at your your different wearables. They look at the data. They understand exactly how you're exercising, how you're sleeping, how you're behaving on a daily basis, your activity. And then they would select specific amounts of carbs, proteins, fat on a daily basis and tailor it to your physical condition. Yeah, and the interesting part of this is the CGM devices, right? Uh, CGM are going to measure your glucose levels constantly. And based on that, they're going to make recommendations for you uh, because there is straight correlation between your glucose level with your insulin. And if you are looking at them and you are eating in a certain way, so for example, if you eat different types of carbohydrates, you spike your insulin uh, or uh, you leave it at normal levels. So if you are actually have access to this information at the times that um, you are before the activity or after the activity, you can tailor much better the recommendations. There are so many apps uh, that are building based on these informations today. So it's like literally the next level of, of the things we see that are going to change in the sports uh, arena is looking at your biomarkers constantly and based on your biomarkers, uh, creating very tailored recommendations for you. So it's going to be, they're going to tell you exactly the type of carbs you need to eat wow. in order to perform the best way possible. Yeah, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Cool. How is, uh, how is your life now in uh, Miami compared to London, uh, Kieran? Uh, it's very different. It's very different. I think just every day is, um, every day is different here. There's, there's less, it's, it's less corporate here, I would say, you know, there's so much tech moving here. There's so much change in lifestyle. 
it's very it's not kind of a traditional like nine to five place uh it's not really a monday to friday place in my experience anyway um it's it's very flexible it's it's very open um and i think where this whole new wave of people are moving here um everyone's kind of it's it's almost like a it feels like a new land like a like a new energy of people you know la- landing here and um peeking out the window and saying oh you know what do you do um everyone's meeting new people so i think that's why the energy is high here at the moment um and then you have the crypto space on top of all of that that's uh you know extremely extremely hot here right now you mentioned it last time in our last discussion what's what are you doing in crypto are you uh what kind of things are you investing in um well i mean i'm investing i'm i'm invest i've invested 50% of my of my salary into bitcoin um for starters so i think i think I, i'm not sure if i was the first or not um i think there may be i i, I would say i'm the first soccer player um i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm aware of any other players doing it um so that kind of just you know created a bit of hype out in this region um and it makes you be able to meet people in the space and find out what these people are what these people are doing out here um and it's it's incredible to see like it's not a it's actually it's quite real um the mayor is very crypto friendly uh he wants to make this kind of like the hub of crypto hub of the world um and you're just seeing it with you know the the basketball arena is now called the FTX arena um our team into Miami is sponsored by XBTO which is a crypto finance company so you're just seeing it um so much more uh, and it it's just moving very fast here last time we spoke uh we had the discussion that uh, me and you Kieran are big fans of cryptocurrencies and Ralph was uh, so much against it so it seems that we were right uh one year after isn't it <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i i guess only time will tell but i actually think Ralph um agrees with the 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 fundamentals of crypto because that's why i love it right i think crypto uh i like to invest in things that can really potentially have a significant impact on many people's lives. Um when I focus on crypto, I'm thinking about, you know, the couple of billion people that still don't have access to a bank account in 2022, which is like, you know, I think money is one of the only things that hasn't developed as fast as, you know, other things have, which is which is so strange to me. Um you know we're coming up with a lot of these new ideas but i still think that there's a lot of room to fix uh to fix money to fix to fix value and how we transact every day um together and it just has so much potential um so that you know there's people out there that are really trying to help um underprivileged people uh and trying to solve issues like inequality and the wealth gap. Um these these are ideas that are really like trying to reshape how we how we are as a society. And that's why I'm an advocate of it. That's why I'm an advocate of you guys because of what you're trying to do in 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 the health data space. You know, so I have a trend of things that I like to follow and invest in. Um And yeah, that's that's why that's why I'm a big fan of crypto, I would say. What uh, what what do you actually invest in aside of cryptocurrencies? Uh how are you thinking of investments? You invest in startups and all that. And uh how can people find you? It's like uh if they want to be raising funds from you, what's what's the usual how do you find them or how how can they find you? Yeah. Well, I I would say first of all going on kind of the the trend of how of the way i like to invest is anything that i believe uh, can be good for the planet um any industry that is 
fast growing, obviously. Um, and anything that is good for society. So these industries, I think, uh, are ones that I like to focus on. Um, you guys are focusing on, you know, health and society, which is like literally something perfect for that I would love to invest in and support. Um, I focus a lot on, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite bullish on emerging markets. You know, Ralph, we spoke about our, our, the guy who introduced us, Youssef. Uh, you're both Algerian. Um, my parents, my mum is English. My dad's from Barbados. Um, but I've grown a fascination towards uh, emerging markets because, you know, you have hundreds of millions of people there where smartphones are on the rise and there's just a lot of room to help you know, hundreds of millions of people. So I would say these are the types of things that I focus on. Um, and then I forgot what your other question was. Um, Kyriakos, sorry. It's how do, how do people, it's like, how oh, yeah, do you how find these investments? Yeah, yeah. And how people find yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think to be honest, I got quite lucky with, um, just who I, who I was, who I grew up with. A lot of my friends are, um, you know, they've turned in, they became VCs. A lot of them went down the public markets, the private markets, and they bring me a lot of deal for it. That's how I met you guys um, through, through my best friend, Youssef. Um, it's hard because you have to be careful with, you know, how you announce being a, an investor, because then you can get inundated with, um, you know, so many people trying to reach out and you would spend your whole life looking through, uh, all of the startups if you're, if you're not careful. Um, so I usually go with, I usually go with, um, my gut instinct on the people around me that are bringing me things. And then, you know, I still have LinkedIn and, um, social media that uh, my company deals with that I can have a look through um, certain things that I might find interesting. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fine line between uh, you have to be, you, you know, you have to be quite selective. It's a fine line between looking at everything and, um, you know, being selective with, with certain companies, but it's always, I always like to focus on the trend. Like I said, of, um, you know, what's good for the planet, what's good for society and, you know, what are the fastest, what are the fastest growing industries and regions. It's, uh, it's the second time that it comes to the di discussion. We had, uh, our last podcast was, was with the, um, with the uh, current person who is running Samsung next. And he said that he focuses on, on trends. So, uh, I think you align on uh, some uh, investment philosophy there. In terms of uh, just before before finishing the discussion, Kieran, what's um, what's next for you? What are you doing in the next few years? Yeah, so my focus is still mainly is is, is soccer, right? Um, I have to say soccer out here, by the way, guys, because I'm so used to it. I'm so used to it now that um, nobody in Europe Europe knows what soccer is. Yeah, man. I know, I know, I know. Sorry, I. Uh, I forgot I was talking to people from back in Europe. Um, you left you left London for eight months and you completely changed, man. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I was so used to it. Uh, yeah, that that's one thing my friend said. Don't ever call it soccer as well. So I've just done it. I've just done it live on uh, on a podcast. So yeah, great. You can try and cut that cut that bit out if you can. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Uh, so. But yeah, my main focus until I stop will, will always be will always be football. Um, I'm very lucky that this gave me the ability to have the life, you know, that I have. So I will always um, focus on that 100%. Um, but then I think I love to just support people that are doing good things. So I think it could be it could be the case that. You know, I invest in various uh, different companies 
and spend my time helping them wherever possible. Um, I would say that and I would say I would definitely like to, you know, focus more on, on the crypto, uh, on the crypto space as the years, as the years progress. And just because I think that's probably what I'm uh, most passionate about. Um, I would say that and uh, yeah, focusing on companies that I invest in because, you know, I've managed to live, you know, live my dream. I like to support people and helping them achieve what they want to achieve in their life. Um, and if, if they're doing things that I agree with that, you know, are having a positive impact on, on the planet, then, uh, and, and, and society, then that's, that's what I'm passionate about. That's wonderful. Kieran, it's always honestly super fascinating to uh, chat to you, either live in person via Zoom, whatever channel we use. Uh, so we look we look forward to seeing you again soon here in London. And uh, if we are ever in uh, Miami, we will definitely ping you. Please do. You know, I'm always inviting you. Um, thank you very much, guys. Uh, always a pleasure. Great to catch up. And yeah. I'll uh, I'll see you I'll see you in the 305 um whenever you can make it. Fantastic. When I see you soon then. Thanks for having me. See you Karen.